All right, so we have a good amount of folks joining us today. My name is Brianna Widener, and I'm an education specialist with the Washington Invasive Species Council. Uh, the Invasive Species Council was established by the legislature in 2006, and it's tasked with providing policy level direction, planning, and coordination for combating harmful invasive species throughout Washington and uh, preventing the in introduction of other invasive species that might potentially be harmful. And one of our major roles is education and outreach. So this week, Governor Jay Inslee uh, proclaimed February 24th to March 2nd as Washington Invasive Species Awareness Week. And um, that week is for raising awareness and finding solutions for invasive species problems. So the webinar you're about to watch today is one of the Invasive Species Awareness Week activities. And um, you can visit our website, invasivespecies.wa.gov to see what other activities we have coming up this week. I'm pleased to introduce Todd Murray, who's going to be our speaker today. Todd is director of the Agricultural and Natural Resources Extension Program Unit. He's with the Washington State University's College of Agriculture, Human and Natural Resource Sciences. And today, Todd is going to be discussing new invasive species that are on the horizon that you should be aware of. So go ahead and take it away for us, Todd. Hey, thanks, Brianna. Hey, I'm really super excited to, to talk to you all today about invasive species. Um, before we get started, I just want to plug a couple of events coming up for those that are in the region. Um, this week on February 28th, we're having our eighth annual Columbia Gorge Invasive Species and Exotic Pest Workshop hosted there in Stevenson. If you go to the council's website, invasivespecies.wa.gov, you'll be able to learn how to sign up for that event if you're interested in coming to the Gorge. Um, we're having a counterpart to that up in Bellingham on March 29th. Um, that one's going to be held right there at the Bellingham Port. Again, you can register for this event uh, at invasivespecies.wa.gov. So these are two uh, uh, in-person trainings. Uh, the topics are relevant to the region that, that we're delivering those to. So I encourage those that work in the invasive species world, uh, sign up for one of these if it's in your region. So with that, you know, um, we're, we're going to talk about a few key pests that I want you to be aware of and be on the lookout for. I also want to put in context why we, we want to educate people about invasive species and exotic pests. Um, for folks that maybe aren't familiar with this insect, this is a spotted wing Drosophila. It's a, a insect that's native to Southeast Asia in a, kind of along the Pacific Rim, which is a significant trade route for us. Uh, this insect in its native home range uh, is a sporadic pest, but, but nothing too detrimental. Um, in 2009, we had someone uh, report this pest in Seattle. And, and subsequently, that pest became pretty prevalent throughout the country very quickly. Um, so I, I think just shortly after 2009, I'll go into uh, 2013, it was in almost every state across the country. Uh, during that time, I was working down in the Columbia River Gorge in Skamania County and, and got this call saying, uh, you know, from a grumpy uh, berry picker saying, I've been picking huckleberries in the same spot for over years and, and never had any wormy berries, and every berry's wormy this year. And and that really sent uh, um, an alarm bell up for me is that is a little bit unusual to, to have such high infestations of, of wormy berries. We do have a few insect, native insects that, that do get into huckleberries, but never really had anybody complain about how common they were. So I went up there. And uh, it was a great day at work. Went up to Indian Heaven Wilderness Area, and if you've never been there, I highly encourage you to go there. It's a, it's a beautiful place. It, it's got a great selection of a lot of different vaccinium species. So I collected berries um, uh, during that time that, that, that was kind of peak towards the end of, of huckleberry season. Uh, collected samples in, in both the Washington and Oregon side, pretty, in pretty high elevations. Uh, uh, to, to see what, what, what people were complaining about. And after a few years of survey, we were actually able to find this new insect, spotted wing Drosophila, 
in a number of locations and in some places in very remote uh, locations in, in Indian Avon Wilderness area. Um, I had a hike in about an hour and a half to, to get to one of our collecting sites. And, and so, so it's pretty impressive that this insect was able to you know, just show up in the country for, for the first time in like 2008 and then quickly spread across the country. And then it only took a, a, a few years to actually get into the nooks and crannies all the way in our wilderness area. And, and where it did occur, it occurred in pretty decent populations. Um, in Peterson Prairie, if you're familiar with that area, uh, almost half of the huckleberries there were infested with this new insect pest, spotted wing drosophila. So, you know, what's the big deal? You know, th th there's a lot of vaccinium species in, in our nat uh, uh, natural areas. This insect is also a, a, a significant pest of small fruits. We have a very large small fruit industry here in Washington State. Uh, this is the first time that blueberry growers really have to spray their blueberries to, to protect themselves against this pest. So there's been a lot of large economical um, impacts uh, uh, due to this insect, but but it's also impacting our our our, our native plants. And and so just for the big deal in in this little spot in Washington, up in Indian Haven Wilderness area. Um, there's over 11 species of vaccinium up there and, and, and another 10 species of rubus, which is like a raspberry and blackberry up there. And there's that one national forest, let alone a whole bunch of other hosts. So this insect is now, now utilizing that. That is a host uh, material. But here's, here's the real impact is, is this changes forever. And, and to really put it in context, let alone our farmers having to deal with a new insect pest on, on small fruits, but, but this specific resource of huckleberries, people have been harvesting huckleberries there for over 10,000 years. And was, you know, it was a real significant um, cultural piece of, of, of humans here in, in North America. And, and so with, with just this one introduction of a new pest in the late 2000s, this resource is, is gonna be forever changed. It's never gonna go back to the way it was. So these impacts, are forever. You know, another idea to put this in context is, is you know, the the impact of invasive species is also global. Um, this is a re this is a really interesting story, and we'll we'll talk more about this pest in in a little while. But um, what's what what you see in in the upper right hand corner of your screen is a beautiful photograph of, of a Bellingham sunset. I lived in uh, Bellingham in the late 1990s and, and there were a few summers where we just had just amazing glowing orange red sunsets. Well, what do the heck does that sunset have to do with an invasive species? Well, the, the picture of the beetle off to the left, that's the Asian longhorn beetle and we'll talk a little bit more about this beetle later. But, but that beetle is, is an unusual beetle in the sense that it feeds, you know, in the immature stages, it feeds on, on trees. And most longhorn beetles that feed on trees like sick and dying trees. They don't necessarily like the healthy ones. This beetle likes the healthy ones. It, 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 it does well on high vigor trees. Um, and, and its native home range is, is that same kind of area on the Pacific Rim uh, in, in Southeast Asia. And, and in Southeast Asia, there, there's a, a, a significant boom in human populations. And, and when you have a lot of uh, people, you have a lot of mouths to feed. And when you have a lot of mouths to feed, you work your agricultural lands really hard. And, and when you work your lands hard, you, your number one enemy is soil erosion, and, and most of that erosion happens through wind erosion. So, so where this beetle is native to, uh, farmers and, and other, other people organized and planted hundreds, if not thousands of miles of, of uh, wind breaks using uh, fast growing, fast growing species of, of trees. And, and so when they planted these wind breaks and they came into the maturity in, in, in the 80s and, and early 90s, uh, essentially 
once they're mature, they that was a smorgasbord for this Asian longhorn beetle to start feeding on those trees. And those those trees have eventually um, uh, um, collapsed and 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 broke. So the windbreaks became ineffective and essentially kicked up a bunch of dust in the atmosphere that gave me very enjoyable sunsets in Northwest Washington. Also what happened when those windbreaks uh, failed, they used that wood material to, to put uh, as a, a shipping packing and, and, and sent product all throughout the world uh, with, uh, using these shipping pallets and, and packing material that, that had beetles in them and, and beetle larvae. And so, so essentially the beetles were then spread, a, spread across to a, to a bunch of locations across the world. So, so these, th this impact of invasive species is, is truly global and, and, a, and it's 100% directly re related to human activities. So, so the Invasive Species Council came up with this, this really in, in, intentive idea to, to target outreach and education for folks like yourself that are interested in this topic to, to, to garner all the different institutes and agencies out there that deal with invasive species and, and coordinate some education to you. So, so they developed a, this new network called the Washington Pest Watch, which, which essentially trains you all to, to be first detectors of these, these pests as you see them. And, and it's a great collaboration between USDA APHIS, uh, WSU, uh, WSDA, and, and the Department of Natural Resources, and it's housed uh, in, in uh, the Recreation and Conservation Office. Uh, so it's a really unique project that's been funded by, by Farm Bill for uh, a few years now to, to help coordinate this educational effort throughout the state. You know, with that, we also want to recruit folks here like yourself uh, to become first detectors, and, and it can be pretty easy. We have some resources for you, so I encourage you to go to their website. You can download the first detector handbook, and it'll kind of generally walk you through uh, uh, what the different types of, of, uh, of ways that you can go about reporting invasive species and which species the council is, is interested in, in, in making you aware of. It's also a great place to stay up to date on educational outreach uh, uh, events like workshops and webinars like this one. Um, we also host uh, pest sightings lifts serve that's specific to pests in Washington State. If you'd like to join that list serve, you can contact me directly. Um, but the, the idea is, is to really recruit the, the everyday person that's outdoors to, to be a first detector and get to know which species belong in Washington State and which ones don't. And, and the ones that don't uh, can respond rapidly by, by using other reporting mechanisms like, uh, like the app, which I'll walk you through. You can go on to Google Play or the Apple Store and download the Washington Invasive Species app. Um, or you can also get the Squeal on Pigs hotline uh, uh, information by downloading that also from, from the Invasive Species Council website. But this app is pretty cool because it, it works and it'll have the list of priority species there. If you're walking around and you're like, hey, I think I see flowering rush, you can click on flowering rush, go up into the corner of that, and, and um, I think I got a highlighter here. And, and, and you can uh, click on report a sighting. When you go to the report a sighting, you select which one you're, you're, you're gonna report on. It grabs your lo sighting location there. You have the opportunity to upload a photo of, of the thing that you think is, is flowering rush. So you take your photo, you make a couple notes about what you're observing and, and how you're observing that, that potential pest sighting. And then you submit it and it submits it up into a reporting format that then gets recorded uh, that goes to centrally to to the to the Inva invasive species council staff and and that staff person will will route that submission sample to the appropriate 
agency or expert that can either confirm or or ID that 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 pest. So so it's a great tool. I encourage you all to download it and uh, and and begin using it to report some of these 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 key pests that we hope you don't run across. You have other ways to report that. You can use, again, the, the direct hotline, or you can uh, report that online at the invasivespecies.wad.gov website. Uh, it'll ask you where you found it, uh, what you think you find, what your uh, what your your contact information is so they can follow up with you, and, and uh, they ask you to submit a photo of that find. Works similar as the app, but it's just all online on, on a website. So every, you know, periodically the, the, the council reviews what are priority pests within the state. And, and that review is based on stakeholder input throughout the state of what, what we think are pests that, that people really need to be aware of and pests that people really need to be on the watch for. And, and so we have a number of insect pests, because that's what we're talking about today, that, that are on the, the priority list. Those that are show up in brown text are insect pests that I covered on a previous webinar. You can watch that previous webinar. It's archived on the Invasive Species Council website. So if you didn't see that, I encourage you to go, go look at it because there's some really interesting pests that, that already occur here in Washington State that we think that you should be aware of, like the brown marmorated stink bug. European chafer is a new pest that's causing a lot of problems in, in the Seattle area. Uh, lily leaf beetles is, is the same. That one's also causing problems in the Seattle area. And then the spotted wing drosophila, which is the one that I, that I just briefly kind of talked about. So today we're, we're going to be highlighting the pests in red. Those are the pests that we don't have and don't ever want to get. So these are ones that it's important that you learn how to recognize them and report them immediately if, if you run across something that looks like these pests. So I'd also like to acknowledge before I go into this is Justin Bush, Kenzie Smith, and Brianna Windner from uh, Washington RCO. A lot of this uh, presentation was compiled with their material, along with uh, uh, Chris and Sven Eric at WSDA, Clayton Campbell at USDA APHIS, Jim Labonte, Josh and Wyatt um, at Oregon ODF and ODA, and then Nick Aflito out there in Cornell, New York. So. The reason why that we put this effort together to, to educate you about these, these potential pest problems is because education really does work. Having a, a knowledgeable and aware uh, group out there that can recognize these pests, it works. It helps us uh, detect pests early and respond rapidly. So here's a great example. Ironically, that same year, 1998, this is Chicago. Um, this is actually a, an old apartment building I used to live in in Chicago in the Ravenswood uh, neighborhood. Well, that, that year there was a city worker uh, up in the maple trees uh, cleaning out dead wood out of those maple canopies. He then uh, um, gave that wood as firewood to a buddy of his. That, that buddy of his loaded that wood in the back of his pickup truck, um, and, and it, which just sat there for a little while. And, and that, that buddy of his noticed beetles emerging from those, the, the pieces of wood that were, were pretty unusual looking. And, and fortunately, this, uh, I think he was an arborist, um, took part in a training very similar to the one that you're, you're at today and learned about a critter uh, called the Asian longhorn beetle. And so, after learning about it and seeing the beetles pop out of the wood that, that he had in the back of his truck, he went online. And remember, this is 1998, so going online wasn't wasn't all that common yet. And went on there and 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 sure enough, said, "Wow, yeah, that sure does look like the beetle that I learned at a workshop similar to this one. Uh, what Asian longhorn beetle looks like." So so then he he sent that beetle to. Uh, uh, a scientist, an entomologist, to get that beetle identification confirmed. That confirmation did come back as Asian longhorn beetle. 
So then what happened is, is in that neighborhood of Ravenswood, they went through and removed every single host material that could be potentially infested by, by the, the Asian longhorn beetle. And it's got a decent host ranger, which we'll talk about in a little while. Um, but they went through and, and, and essentially uh, removed all the trees in the neighborhood, all uh, 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 host shrubs also, uh, it, which was a significant, significant undertaking. And, and I don't know if anybody has been in Chicago uh, during, during the summer, but shade trees are of high value. And, and it was a real unfortunate loss for, for this neighborhood to lose all their shade trees. So everything said and done, this is a long process. It, it cost well over $100 million. Um, but a uh, total removal was about uh, 1,700 mature trees. And then they treated another, another 92,000 trees with, with, an, uh, with an injectable insecticide as, as a kind of a, a protective along the outer edge of, of that quarantine area. So it was a very expensive, very costly, very disruptive um, um, effort. And the interesting thing is, is, is in this neighborhood, um, they lost pretty much all their shade trees because all their shade trees were of similar hosts. And, and the reason for that was, is historically that neighborhood had, had um, elm trees as the dominant street tree but uh, another exotic pest, the, the Dutch elm disease, came through and, and wiped all those out. So they replanted all with maples. So uh, fast forward uh, a, a few more years to Tukwila in Washington State, and and we had a situation where a nurseryman had put bonsai nursery plants in quarantine that they received from, I believe. Uh, well, somewhere in Southeast Asia, but I believe it's Korea. And, and so they had their bonsai plants in quarantine. Uh, uh, this nurseryman also participated in an educational event where they learned about Asian longhorn beetle. And, and so when this nursery person saw Asian similar looking beetle chew itself out of, of one of the bonsai trees, they immediately contacted WSDA. WSDA came out, confirmed that it's Asian longhorn beetle. It's actually a kissing cousin called citrus longhorn beetle. Um, and went into that neighborhood and uh, uh, removed uh, the number of host trees from that immediate area. They, they did see a, a couple beetles or at least one beetle take off. And they, they were aware of another beetle on site. So, so it was a similar program as Chicago, but just highly scaled down because the initial detection was so immediate. And, and so this cost was, uh, was uh, less than a million dollars um, and, and, and took a, a, a much shorter time. So the point is the, the sooner that we can recognize a problem, the quicker that we have a chance of getting rid of it, pending on the pest. In the case of the spotted wing Drosophila, it was so widespread so rapidly uh, and, it, and we didn't understand how it was spreading so rapidly that we couldn't necessarily stop it. But in these cases with Asian longhorn beetle and citrus longhorn beetle, an early detection sure led to a rapid response that, that, that did, did eradicate the, those beetle populations. So why, why are we having this problem? Um, Species have been migrating ever since people have been migrating. So you always get a species that'll hitchhike. What's happening now though, is, is the amount of, of cargo and people moving across the globe has increased significantly. And just one example, um, world trade has been increased at a steady rate of about seven and a half percent annually from the fifties to about 2007. And, and this was based on policies as we started opening up more global markets. And if you recall the riots in 1999 uh, in Seattle, the, the WTO conference, um, some of those policies uh, um, increased the, the ability to, to form these larger global markets. And, and what that means is there's just a lot more stuff moving around the, the globe. And and as we kind of settle into these uh, larger global markets, you know, 
the that rate is has increased pretty significantly since uh, since 2007 is and expected to for to, to increase for for quite a while um, when you do that you run the risk of, of bringing hitchhikers here's some great pictures um, of of the Asian gypsy moth infestation in Russia, which is a coastal town and a port town. Uh, there was an outbreak there of Asian gypsy moth. As those ships that came into port there loaded up on product, those ships then came over here to Port of Vancouver and, and would um, bring some Asian gypsy moths uh, along with that, even after inspectors and treatment uh, um, uh, attempted to get rid of rid of any hitchhikers on there. It's just it, it's it's pretty difficult to get them all. Now here's here's a uh, um, uh, egg case hiding underneath one of those uh, big large uh, lead pallets. Here's another great example. Is is you know in in, in an honest system, most most people will will try and comply once. Once we realized that Asian longhorn beetle was being spread around on those pallets globally, uh, there was some good regulatory action taken to help require that those pallets are going to be treated before they, they, they come into, into port. And, and so there, there's a certification process and a treatment process so that, that people have to follow to, to, uh, to, to get that stuff um, um, through our ports. Um, given that, here's a great picture of people trying to hide the fact that some of those wood pallets are harboring insects by slapping some some wood putty o over that. And these, these pictures are from Jim Labonte at, at ODA. Um, so, so there's all this uh, this product moving around there globally that they can hitchhike on. There's also a lot of plant product moving around. Great study was was uh, done by a group of um, forest entomologists looking at really what the live plant imports look like as a major pathway of, of forest uh, uh, insect and pathogen invasions in the US. And, and they looked, they really assessed the country's capacity to manage that. And this is in the mid, mid to later 2000s where, where they really saw that, that the ability to regulate the amount of um, material that, that's moving is, is is pretty daunting. You know, there's only about at the time 65 full-time personal inspections, uh, uh, um, personnel inspecting incoming plant shipments at, at about 17 inspection stations throughout the country. Uh, we imported about you know a little bit over three billion plants in in uh, 2007. So doing the math, that's a that's a, a pretty high workload per inspector, and and they're not. You know they're they're going to have a hard time being able to catch everything even through those regulated pathways. Um, in a time of smaller government, this this scenario isn't isn't getting any better. So so we really live in a really unusual time. You know some people call this the Anthropocene, where where they're seeing humans actually impact. You know what they think the fossil record is going to look like in in millions of years. But but we, we have a, a series of three events that, that are that are really driving this unusual time where we we have a changing climate which is which is producing a bunch of susceptible hosts as things get drought stressed, they're more susceptible to attack. Uh, changing climates will also shift uh, uh, origins of, of our imports as as uh, markets kind of adapt to, the, to that changing climate. Uh, we also are experiencing an increased number of just species being moved around because of the amount of, uh, of product moving around. And then we're seeing a, a relative decrease or, or, or daunting ability to, to keep up with all that uh, in a regulatory fashion. So, so a few authors looked at this as a risk uh, assessment and and first uh, uh, guessed at about 32% risk that we get something more damaging than emerald ash borer in North America in the next 10 years. And they elevated that up to, to about 70% because of these factors. So here in the Northwest, uh, we get a lot of new bugs. 
ODA has documented about 66 new introductions since 2007. Uh, WSDA has documented uh, over 70 new insect pests since uh, since the early 90s, and, and so we've had a lot of insect introductions, but we've we've documented over 70 new actual pests here here in Washington State. Um, who's finding all these bugs? This is a great study done by uh, Chris Looney and crew. Um, our regulatory agencies like WSDA are our mission to survey for for these exotic pests and and they they find about 28 percent through survey targets so hang, going around and hanging those those uh, uh, um, orange or whatever type traps that you see hanging in trees uh, th that accounts for about 20 28 percent of those new finds um, they also sift through those traps and 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 that accounts for another 20 percent of new new finds but but if you look at the other side of the pie where where the public is is uh, responsible for about a third of, of all those new insects being detected and, and found here in Washington State. So so it's people like you that are out there working and and run across something that you haven't seen before and and send it through the channels to get it reported and documented. So so you all are are a very significant contributor to to new finds here in Washington State. So the first one I want to kind of uh, go over and put on your radar is a Japanese beetle. Um, folks that live back east are familiar with this one as it's been back east for a number of years. It's native to Japan, but was found in, in uh, New Jersey in, in, uh, um, in 1916, was the first recorded documentation of it. Since then, it, it's kind of um, festered there. The beetles have adapted locally and, and, and um, um, were able to evolve to be successful over on the East Coast. And now they're, they've spread slowly west and, and are now found in, in 22 states back east. Um, they have a, a really wide host range. This also helps them be so successful. But they, they feed on, um, they, they have about 430 known host plants, and a lot of those we consider as, as food plants, crops, and uh, ornamentals. Um, just alone back east, they're responsible for causing, you know, $150 million worth of turf damage. Uh, it is probably one of the most important turf pests in the U.S., even though they feed on such a wide range of, of plants. Turf is, turf is their main staple. Um, this is one that we've always, always had on our radar because they move around through uh, cargo planes. And so we'll often find uh, beetles showing up at our airports. So WSDA regularly traps and manages populations as they come into airports and expect, inspects those pieces of cargo so, so they aren't introducing them via the airports. Um, unfortunately, there was a, a population that began to brew down with our neighbors in Oregon. And so they have a significant uh, uh, area that now has Japanese beetle right there in the greater Portland area. Uh, um, they also found this beetle in British Columbia in 2018. So we're essentially um, sandwiched in between uh, 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 two our, our neighbors uh, with Japanese beetles. So, so the concern is it's only an amount of time that beetles start bubbling uh, across our borders and, and, and into Washington counties. So this is an important one for you to, to report the second you see it and, and uh, um, give give uh, regulatory officials an opportunity to, to come in and, and try and try to eradicate it if possible. Um, this one's interesting because it had, much of its life cycle is cryptic as it takes place underground. Uh, the larvae, as you can see here, are these C-shaped grubs. Um, this is a natural C-shape. This is what they look like. We have other insects that also uh, occur in this shape, like root weevil larvae, uh, but they won't have such well-developed legs. And the C shape is, is, is a natural form. If, if you try to stretch them out, um, their guts will burst all over the place and, and, and they don't want to stay in the C shape. 
uh, and you won't see anything else that has such a characteristic C-shaped, well-developed head capsule and, and well-developed legs living in your turf. We do have a new pest in the Seattle area called European chafer that looks similar to this. It's a little bit larger than Japanese uh, beetle. So if, if you're in the Seattle area and you do see this in the turf, um, it is important to make note of it, but it's probably European chafer. So most of this life cycle takes place underground. In spring, they, they come closer to the surface. They pupate after feeding. They emerge in June, July. And the adults do the very characteristic skeletonization of, of plant material, uh, get energy that way, uh, go back to the soil, lay eggs to repeat the whole cycle over again. So, so, they, so, so they have an annual life cycle. This is what you need to look out for. These beetles are very, very colorful. They have some emerald uh, green to them. They're coppery in color. They have these little white tufts. Uh, uh, surrounding their bodies. They cause this really unusual uh, skeletonizing damage to foliage. Uh, when you see it, report it. If you're outside of Seattle area and you see those C-shaped grubs in your lawn, report those also. Uh, those, those could be Japanese beetle. We also want to monitor the, the progress of the European chafer too. All right, the next one, this one's relatively new. You all might have seen this in the in the news this past year. This one's called the spotted lander, lander fly. It was discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014. Again, this one is also native to Southeast Asia, uh, feeds on a, a number of uh, species, host plants, but it includes apples, grapes, and, and some hardwoods. Its favorite, favorite thing that, that it likes to eat is the tree of heaven. So, so it's, uh, it's now um, was first thought to be pretty well contained in Pennsylvania, but it turned out that, it, that they've been able to find new reports where it's spreading out from, from that initial infestation or perhaps those are other in introductions happening uh, uh, to, where, to where this one's not contained anymore on, on the East Coast and they're trying to, trying to manage, manage its, its spread. Uh, this is one that we really are concerned about in Washington State, mainly because of uh, we have a lot of its prefer preferred host, Tree of Heaven, and, uh, and this could be a significant problem for our grape growers. Uh, it has an interesting life cycle. Uh, adults lay, lay these kind of uh, foamy, foamy uh, egg cases uh, that they overwinter on in those egg cases. Those will hatch in, in May and June. They are these kind of brightly um, white spotted, speckled, uh, unusual insects that you'll see crawling around, uh, uh, feeding on the, the sap of, of host plants. As that nymph matures, it starts getting more red on it and, and then uh, uh, emerges as an adult uh, in late mid to late summer and, and continues as the adult until probably the first killing frosts. It's a very striking insect. You're not going to confuse it with much else. Um, the other thing to look out for is, is uh, are these egg, egg cases. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, 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 mildews associated with it as they exude some, some, uh, some honeydew and so forth. And, and you'll see these aggregations of nymphs feeding. Uh, you'll also see as they become uh, uh, as they become adults, you'll see these large adult uh, aggregations. And, and so, if you see this, definitely definitely call report it. Um, this past year, we also found that it may have been moving around on on Christmas trees. So, so if you do purchase a Christmas tree next year, have this on your radar and 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 make sure that that you're not bringing in a uh, spotted lanternfly. All right, finally, we're gonna talk about the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, this one, again, is also native to uh, uh, that, that uh, Pacific Rim, Southeast Asia. It's first detected in Brooklyn, New York in, in the mid 90s. Um, these things are, are pretty sizable beetles. And, and when they emerge, and we got some pictures of them, when they emerge, they, they create a pretty big hole in, in the side of those trees. And, and so 
there in Brooklyn, you know, it was probably there for, for a few years and everybody just assumed those were bullet holes because the holes were so big. Uh, but it wasn't until somebody actually saw a beetle emerge out of it uh, that, that they realized that, that there's something else going on. The Asian longhorn beetle attacks uh, a number of species of trees that include poplar, willow, elm, uh, maple, a lot of our, our high-valued street trees and, and our hard, hardwood industries. The potential urban impact is is humongous. It's, it's you know look at that number. It's it's close to seven seven hundred billion dollar impact. Um, rapid dispersal is is mainly due to the movement of that solid wood packing material, and and uh, the concern here is if we get uh, spots of it here in the states, it'll move through other other things like firewood. Again. Uh, the larvae are, are pretty chunky. The, the adults are pretty big. Um, the adults are can be up to a, you know up to an inch and a quarter. They're they're kind of elongate in shape. They have uh, black and white striped antennae. They have some shiny spots on the bottom, and their legs have have some blue tinge to them. Uh, these are great characteristics, and I really want to point out the glossy appearance. Of, of the back that, that's characteristic and it'll help you distinguish it from some of our native species. This is a damage that this is what you need to look out for. And, and we'll see this damage, especially in Western Washington and our maples. It's often due to pollution or something else where, where you'll get a portion of, of the canopy that, um, that flags red and, and and when you see that, that's probably nothing to, to have huge concern about. But if you see um, groups of trees flagging red, where you know maybe you know groups of ten or twenty trees that are all flagging red, that's something that that's worth reporting. Um, this is a picture I took in Chicago when, when they found the beetle, and it, it was striking. The 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 canopies were all flagged with this red foliage because essentially what happens are, are the beetles exit in uh, in uh, Juneish and and as they June to July and as they exit that that part of the tree loses all its trigger pressure and so they were emerging in such large numbers that it actually sounded like people had garden hoses running in their yards and those that, that was the trees just expelling so much sap. And, and losing their trigger pressure and essentially just desiccating that part of the canopy. So if you go in and look closer at those trees, you'll see those really sizable large exit holes. Also what to look for is once those um, adults have emerged, the female will go around and, and notch out with their uh, mouth parts, these little indents into the tree, and then she'll turn around and overposit an egg in there. So, so this notching is also pretty characteristic. When we get a find of Asian longhorn beetle, essentially, the the State Departments and and the and the USDA recruit a number of tree climbers to to scour trees for for this telltale sign of a uh, of beetle activity of these overpositional wounds. We have some lookalikes here. We have the banded alder borer. Uh, it looks a lot like Asian longhorn beetle, but some key differences here is vandal alder borer, which is a native, has a single black circle right there on the thorax. Uh, the, the coloration comes in bands, and this one looks like it was spray painted with a flat paint. So it's not shiny whatsoever. It's very flat in color. Well, you can see Asian longhorn beetle is very shiny. Another one that we have is the Oregon fur sawyer, and we have some Oregon fur sawyer where the coloration just looks like a dead ringer to an Asian longhorn beetle. Even makes me freak out sometimes when I see them. Um, but the key distinguishing uh, uh, feature here is the texture of of the wing covers. This is called punctate, or it's a, it's kind of pimply. So if you were to run your finger along the back. It would feel rough and bumpy. While you run your finger along the back of Asian longhorn beetle, it's very smooth, smooth and shiny. The other thing is, is there, there's also a nice little patch of white hairs that's pretty consistent for the Oregon fur sawyer. So, so if you superficially see a beetle, um, uh, look for those types of characteristics before 
before you uh, you decide to report it as an Asian long term deal. All right, management. You know, if you are in a place where where it is active, uh, be aware of those quarantine zones. Don't move material out of those uh, uh, zones. What when these populations pop up, um, they essentially come in. You saw it. They destroy uh, infested trees and then go through and and do tree ejections to to try and stop any further movement outside of that quarantine area. So it's pretty aggressive manage, management. It's very costly. It's why we really encourage um, um, if we do get a, a flare up of this beetle that, that someone recognize it early and report it right away. Okay, I think the last one I'm going to cover before we leave a few minutes for questions is the emerald ash borer. This one's native to eastern Russia. It's first noticed in, in the Midwest in 2002, uh, quickly moved uh, throughout the northeast and Midwest, and now is in, I think it's even more than 28 states now. It's killed tens of millions of ash trees in the U.S. Um, it's, it, it's, it's been very expensive for those municipalities and riparian areas to, to manage this, this insect and deal with it. Um, its main rapid dispersal is, is through its own dispersal capabilities. You know, they, they can naturally disperse pretty, pretty readily, but it's the movement through wood packing material and, and firewood in those infested areas. Um, identification, we have a lot of natives that, that look a lot like this beetle. These are called jewel beetles, but the emerald ash borer is, is coppery red when you flip open the wing covers. Uh, but it, it essentially looks metallic green. We have other ones here. Um, the bronze birch borer can look like it. We have some native ones that, that affect um, 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 conifer trees that look like it. So, so if you see a beetle like this, don't don't immediately assume that, that it's uh, emerald ash borer because we have a lot of several look look likes in, in, that are native. Um, yeah, you know, they're they, they can build up rapidly in populations. Uh, many of you have probably seen this slide before, but uh, this is a picture of some street trees in uh, back east and and how quick those street trees uh, uh, succumb to attack. Uh, but this is what you want to look out for. the The key characteristics is is if you know we don't have a lot of ash in Washington State. It's mainly uh, a municipal tree, so so it's something a tree species that you'll see in, in public areas or yards. Um, in western Washington, especially southwest Washington, we do have natives that, that are important riparian species, um, um, but it, but it's uh, ash isn't as prevalent as it is back east. But it's definitely one that we want to be on the lookout for. So if you see an ash tree that that overall looks cruddy. Um, the canopy is weak. It doesn't look like it's doing very well. Sometimes you'll see large swaths of bark sh uh, shedding off. Um, but if you see this epicormic growth along the main stem or main struck of the trunk of this tree, that's very, very, very suspicious. Go take a closer look at that tree. And if you see a D-shaped hole, these beetles characteristically will, will chew out a, a exit hole that's in the shape of a letter D. So the combination of an ash tree with epicormic growths on them and a D-shaped hole, that's your, your combination where you should, you should report that tree. Um, management is pretty aggressive too. Essentially, they, they try to remove uh, all the host, host material and then follow up with, with tree in, injection. So, so it's a pretty aggressive management uh, process, much like, uh, much like uh, uh, Asian longhorn beetle. So, you know, I'm gonna stop there. And, and if there's questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them here. Um, also encourage you to contact me directly. This is my email, my phone number. Uh, and, and you can access us all through the uh, Invasive Species website. Um, but with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anything's popping up in the chat box. All right, so um, thank you so much, Todd. And like he said, if you have any questions, please type them and I'll ask them for the group. 
but just following up on uh, just a bit of what he was saying at the end, how there are some lookalikes for things like the emerald ash borer or the longhorn beetles. If you see something and you're not sure, we'd much rather you make a report and us have the good fortune of saying that's not what it is, um, then you just start dismissing it. So if you see something, you're not sure, please let us know and uh, we'll figure it out for you. All right, so we're getting some thanks for the webinar. That's great. No questions just yet. I'm more than happy to hang out for a while. Mm -hmm. Yep, we'll be here around till one. And like you said, if a question comes to you later, feel free to email Todd directly. Oop. All right, so we have a couple questions. Let's see. This one says, with the introduction of the app, have you noticed an increase in reporting of invasives? That's a great question. I think Justin, who's, who's the executive director, is, has intentionally developed all of us to deliver this type of education so, so we can go back and measure it. Definitely the activity of the app has increased significantly. You know, there, there's a number of other ways to report too. But overall, with with this coordinated outreach, we have seen seen an increase. And we're also in the process of uh, developing some lesson plans right now that involve kids getting outside, students um, using the app to report invasive species on their schoolyards. So hopefully, we'll get even more reporters after that. All right, um, let's see. Next question, anything in particular in Kitsap County we need to be on the lookout for? Kitsap County, that's a great question. Kitsap County, I'd say um, all of those that we covered today are, are, are ones that you need to be aware of. Um, because you're in the Puget Sound where, where you have a lot of ports and, and military vessels uh, coming back and forth, you're, you're at a, you're you're at a you're at a hot spot of concern. So so definitely keep your eye out for everything that we've covered today. All right. Um, next question: Does the emerald ash borer only attack ash trees? Yes. In in that case, that is the that that genus. Well, well let, let me think about that. Yeah, there might be a couple outside that genus, but but essentially it only affects ash trees as far as a mortality factor. Um, whenever whenever you come up with a hard fast rule about an insect, it, it's pretty amazing how you can often find exceptions to that. But out of all the pests that that we covered today, that one has the most narrow host range of of them all, and and so it, we're predominantly concerned about uh, its occurrence on ash trees. All right, thank you. Well, this one's a great one. I've been teaching workshops on invasive species. How can I tie into overall efforts? Oh, that's perfect. Come to the invasive species uh, website, interface with the council. Uh, we'd love to partner up with you and load you up with as much, whatever you need to continue your teaching. Yep, and um, I'll add to that, so on our website, invasivespecies.wa.gov. We have some canned presentations similar to the one that uh, Todd gave today that go over a couple of our primary species. One of them we're about to put up is on the spotter and lanternfly. So if you uh, wanted to teach about some of our focal priority species but didn't have the time to make a presentation, you can just borrow that and uh, we'd happily have you use it. So great, thank you. The, the, the one main thing that, that really the council has been great at is normalizing all the messages that all the educators use out there. So, so please drive people to the, to the council's way of reporting um, to, to report any su suspect species. All right, um, let's see. So quite a few people want to know about uh, their specific areas. So one is wondering, are there any particular uh, baddies you know of in the Grays Harbor area? Well, right, Grays Harbor, you know, again, you, you are in a port area. Um, I would, you know, 
I would go to the council's website. We have a number of uh, marine invasives that we're concerned about. And that, that'd be one to also familiarize with with, uh, with the marine invasives. We've had, I believe, uh, some webinars on, on like uh, green crab uh, that you can access those resources on, on the council's website. All right, so that was the Great Harbor. Um, probably pretty simple, similar, but any particular invasive species to be on the lookout for in the Olympic Peninsula or the Port Townsend area? Oh, definitely, definitely um, be aware of green crab and, and some of those marine organisms in addition to the insects that, that we covered today. All right. Um, does the military have inspection programs? That's another great question. Um, yes, and they also access us for their educational outreach because, you know, things, I didn't cover gypsy moth because, and I should point this out, our State Department of Ag does a great job um, managing and de dealing with gypsy moth. And, and, and one of its major routes of spreading is hitchhiking on people's own personal belongings like their car or, or their their you know the stuff that they packed up to move out west and 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 we saw some some of that traffic coming straight out to our military bases and and so so there was a level of education deployed right there at those military bases to teach people how to you know clean off or report any egg masses or, or any hitchhikers they, they might have picked up specifically for, for gypsy moth. But but the, the USDA has a program that inter interfaces with military directly to, to help manage that. We interface with international um, students as they come in to, to, as another potential route. So pretty much anybody that's, that's not from here um, is is potentially moving stuff there and and we try to uh, develop programming specific to those people all right um, here's another good one there are two other reporting systems for brown marmorated stink bugs and lily leaf beetle um, with the WSU and WSDA respectively do these reports connect to the Washington invasive species mapping they do and, and so all those funnel into the same thing. Uh, we, we have a reporting specifically that WSU manages for brown marmorated stink bug um, that's being mapped, but all those records are, are shared and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And all um, of the, oh, sorry. Oh, just, uh, for the WSDA one, they're specifically looking for another bug called the, the Southern Green Bug. And, and we report, any reports that we get of that, we run through WSDA. And so um, following up on that, with the Washington Invasives app, any report you make on that app comes to the Invasive Species Council, and then we direct that to whatever group it's germane to. So if we did get a brown marmorated stink bug, for example, a report on them, we would then pass it on to whoever's in charge of that, be it WSU or WSDA. And then like Todd said, all of that data gets um, shared on a website called EDMAPS, E-D-D-M-A-P-S, and anyone can use that invasive species data. It's a really cool resource. Um, all right, um, I see many of the species on the app are already widespread in Western Washington, such as Scott's broom or Japanese knotweed, Himalayan blackberry. Are you seeking additional reports for these widespread species? In some instances, yes. Um, priority species are also designated as species that we want the public to also be aware of. And, and yeah, Scotch broom is, is a great example. Same with spotted wing drosophila or brown marmorated sting bug. They're pretty widespread now. And, and so it, it moves to more of an awareness campaign than, than uh, reporting and, and us being able to do anything to, to manage their populations. Mm -hmm. And it is great for us to know where they are. So even though they are pretty ubiquitous um, at this point, we still like getting those reports because it helps us get a picture on how big the problem is. And sometimes, you know, if we realize it's larger than we expected, um, we might be able to get more funding 
uh, for those kind of seemingly innocuous, or sorry, um, overwhelming invasive species. So it's, it's better, more data we have, the better. So please report it um, so we know where it is. Yeah, the, the ed maps also interface with how, um, if you have a county noxious weed program, how they collect data also. So, so in the case of like a, a scotch broom, it also might help develop a, a, a management plan to a specific area if, if, if they see a lot of spread happening in one area. Mm -hmm. We've seen that mainly with like um, uh, Japanese knotweed and, and, and those type, type of organisms. All right. Um, is there a similar invasive species pest watch for Idaho? Great question. Um, I'm not too sure. They do have a council, and I'd encourage you to reach out to the, the Idaho's council and, and see what Idaho is doing. All right. Um, do you have time for maybe one more, Todd? Sure. Okay. Uh, it's one more specific one. So I guess which of these have shown up? Are any of the um, insects you talked about today in Clallam County? None of the insects that we've talked about today should should occur in Washington State. So so the the species that we covered today, these should not be in the state. And and so if 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 you have something that that you think is one of these species, um, report it. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you again, Todd. Hey, thanks for having me.